This week on the Writer's Detective Bureau, the New Hall Incident, Undercover Reasoning, and Third-Party Justifiable Homicide. I'm Adam Richardson, and this is the Writer's Detective Bureau. Welcome to episode number 86 of the Writer's Detective Bureau, the podcast dedicated to helping authors and screenwriters write professional quality crime-related fiction. This week, I'm talking about how the Writer's Detective Bureau is raising money for those that need help the most during our current COVID-19 pandemic, as well as marking the 50th anniversary of the Newhall incident and answering your questions about the reasons for a detective to go undercover, as well as whether a homicide can be ruled justifiable if it's committed by a third party. But first, I need to thank Gold Shield patrons Deborah Dunbar from DebraDunbar.com, CC Jameson from CCJameson.com, Larry Keaton, Vicki Tharp of VickiTharp.com, Chris Ann, Larry Darter, Natalie Borelli of NatalieBorelli.com, Craig Kingsman of CraigKingsman.com, Lynn Vitali, Marco Caracari of MarcoCaracari.com, and Robert Mendenhall for their support, along with my Silver Cuff Link and Coffee Club patrons. You can find links to all of the Bureau's patrons in the show notes at writersdetective.com forward slash 86. This month's Patreon deposit just hit my account, and 100% of that money was donated to Masks for Docs to provide PPE to those on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you have funds or N95 masks you'd like to donate, or you're a first responder or medical professional that is in immediate need of PPE, go to MasksForDocs.com to get connected right now. And to learn more about patronage through Patreon, go to WritersDetective.com forward slash Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Speaking of worthy causes, reviewing this podcast on podchaser.com will raise money for the Meals on Wheels COVID-19 response fund. Podchaser has pledged to donate 25 cents for every podcast review left at podchaser.com, and they will double that pledge if the podcast owner replies to the review. So let's do this. I created a quick link to make this super easy. Go to writersdetectivebureau.com forward slash review to get to my podcast page on Podchaser and then click on the review tab. And once you've left a review, I will reply. And each time we do this, that's a half dollar towards getting food delivered to homebound seniors that are most at risk for COVID-19. So Podchaser is running this pledge campaign through April 15th of 2020. So let's get after it right now. Writersdetectivebureau.com forward slash review, and then click on the review tab. As I record this, it is the evening of the 6th of April 2020, which happens to be the 50th anniversary of a watershed moment in policing. Just after midnight on April 6th, 1970, four California Highway Patrol officers were murdered by two gunmen in Newhall, California, which is not far from where Magic Mountain Amusement Park is currently located. All four of those officers were killed in less than five minutes, and the two gunmen escaped that night. They were subsequently identified, with one killing himself in a hostage standoff with the L.A. Sheriff's Department, and then the other spent the rest of his life in a California prison. But every cop in California has learned about the Newhall incident, because it reframed how we think about tactics and training. You may have heard the saying, as you train, so shall you fight. It was through studying the Newhall incident that law enforcement, especially in California, learned this the hard way. These brave young officers in this moment of crisis relied on their training, as we do in these kind of crisis situations, and their training failed them. But their deaths were not in vain, as this incident sparked dramatic changes in how law enforcement trains their officers, especially when it comes to officer safety tactics. And those changes still remain to this day. And they have, without a doubt, saved the lives of thousands of cops in hundreds of thousands of instances where this 
post Newhall incident, modern understanding of how training translates to real world situations has prevented more cops from being murdered. So on this 50th anniversary of the horrific Newhall incident, we are still honoring the legacy of CHP officers, Frago, Gore, Allen, and Pence. You have taught us all that as you train, so shall you fight. This week's first question comes from Reese Lawrence, who asked, do detectives often go undercover? And if so, what are usually the reasons? Undercover work is certainly a specialized type of policing, Reese, but it's usually done as a last resort. The benefits of having a police detective go undercover are that when it's used in court, it's firsthand knowledge and firsthand testimony. And also, detectives are trained in understanding the laws about entrapment and coercion, so they know how to avoid saying or doing anything that could lead to any crimes they witness from being thrown out in court. And then as a quick aside, entrapment is when the police officer plants the seed in the mind of the defendant to commit a crime. Popular culture might have you think it means something else, like using some sort of trickery or a ruse or straight up lie in an interview to get you to admit to a crime you committed or something like that. But that's not entrapment. Entrapment is me telling you to go buy me some drugs and then arresting you for doing that when you bring them back to me. The only reason you committed the crime was because I planted the seed in your mind for you to do it. Now that is entrapment. Anyway. Back to the undercover stuff. So if you can get an undercover detective into a place where crimes are occurring or involved in a criminal organization, then you have the potential for a really far-reaching case against the suspects. But these kinds of investigations bring the highest risks. Most quote-unquote undercover investigations are actually run with informants rather than undercover detectives. Informants being people that are motivated to work with the police for whatever reason, whether that's working off pending criminal charges, um, they're getting paid by the police, or they're getting revenge against someone, whatever their motivation is, um, they're already planted through their own life circumstances, most likely in a position where they can obtain evidence of crimes in a way similar to how an undercover detective would. Um, but frankly, informants are way better at it because they pass the sniff test. By passing the sniff test, I mean they're already part of that world. The people they're informing on have probably known or know of this person, and there's a lot less likelihood of them being perceived as being a cop or working for the cops. Now, that said, detectives do work undercover, but the ones that do are usually assigned to a unit where that is part of their job duties, like a narcotics unit or a vice unit. Units where the detectives are working surveillance and running informant-based investigations on a daily basis, and these detectives are trained on how to do work undercover. So if your suit-and-tie detective is working a homicide, and the investigation reveals that it's tied to a drug trafficking organization, it is not going to be that suit and tie homicide detective that is going to go undercover. It would most likely be one of the narcotics detectives. And the other thing to understand is that working undercover is a very labor intensive investigation. Sending a detective into a potentially hostile location requires all sorts of additional help, like a dedicated team of cops to act as a rescue team and a surveillance team and someone monitoring the audio of any body wires that the undercover might be wearing. All of this because your UC needs to have the cavalry within arm's reach if the situation goes south. Also, running an undercover operation for street-level drug buys or prostitution stings is very different than running a deep cover operation where someone is embedded in a criminal organization for the long term. And by long term, I mean months or even years. And honestly, that very rarely, if ever, happens at the local police department level. Not only is it expensive, but the detectives are quite possibly already known to the criminals in that city. If you're a newly minted narcotics detective that just got promoted into narcs from patrol, do you think all the hypes and meth heads are going to forget the time you arrested them? Real life is not like glasses on Clark Kent, glasses off Superman, glasses on. Oh, hey, Clark, where did Superman go? He was just here a second ago. The only way to not run that risk, especially in a deep cover kind of UC case, is to use someone that wasn't working patrol in the area where the case is running. 
I was assigned to a few different units that worked these kinds of special operations, and I've spent time as the UC, but I never worked in a deep cover assignment. I have, however, been part of surveillance teams and part of UC rescue teams for several cases where the long-term deep cover UC was a federal agent. The feds are the ones with the money, manpower, and resources to run long-term undercover operations safely. Well, (laughs) relatively safely. As safely as you can by putting a special agent into a den of hardcore criminals. To be safe means you have the money and resources to dedicate to mitigating hazards and not just winging it. But back to Reese's deceptively simple question. The biggest question is, what is the reason for the undercover case in the first place? What's the goal of the entire case? Is it to solve a murder or shut down a transcontinental drug trafficking organization or shut down a human trafficking pipeline? So not only do we determine whether the risk is worth the reward, we're also trying to figure out whether an undercover investigation can ever really reach the intended goal. If three guys commit a murder, How would a UC enter the equation and get any kind of evidence? It's not like the three guys are going to invite our UC over for a beer and start talking about the time they killed some dude. So in this situation, like the three guys commit a murder, we'd use the argument that introducing an informant or a UC, an undercover detective, I should have explained that a second ago, would not only raise the suspicions of the suspects risking the lives of the UC or informant, but they would also not likely result in any evidence of the crime only jeopardizing further and future investigative methods. We'd probably use that argument as part of our application to get a wiretap going on those three, especially because the crime is in the past. It's no longer occurring, and the evidence we need is specific to this singular incident. Now, compare that to obtaining evidence in an ongoing criminal enterprise like HT, uh, human trafficking, or narcotics trafficking. As we weasel our way into the organization— we're obtaining more and more evidence of crimes that are occurring and are continuing to occur. We aren't looking back for evidence of a singular crime like a murder, but instead we're stacking criminal charges as they are observed and as evidence is obtained. But again, this is by far done by the feds more than anyone else. FBI and DEA definitely run long-term and robust undercover investigations, but the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, are by far the most active and seasoned UC operators that I've ever encountered. Rob Kearns is back again this week with another great question, and you can find his work at nightsfall.press, and that's night like Knights of the Round Table. Ooh, pizza sounds good right now. Rob writes, hello again, sir. I'm starting the fourth book in my fantasy series, and I encountered a question that I thought might have broader appeal than just my situation. Here's the scenario. There's a hostage situation at a local university. One of the perpetrators has a hostage pressed against the window in full view of the crowd, press, law enforcement, etc., and is going to kill her. Just before the perpetrator can carry out the act, an outside party intervenes, killing the immediate threat and incapacitating the other perpetrators with no further hostages harmed. The outside party who intervenes is the father of the hostage being threatened. And while the jurisdiction where it occurs does not have castle doctrine or stand your ground laws on the books, they are part of the common law. Also important to note, the only firearms involved are those used by the perpetrators. The dead perpetrator was killed with a dagger. So the question, what would the legal consequences be for the person who intervened? I hope you and yours are well, and thank you for all you do. Best wishes for the coming weeks. Regards, Rob. Thank you very much, Rob. And this is a great question. We often think about justifiable homicide as homicide committed in self-defense. But a homicide can be justifiable if it's in the defense of someone else's life who's in immediate danger. Since I live and work in California, I'm governed by the California Penal Code. And Section 197, Parent 1, states, quote, Homicide is also justifiable when committed by any person when resisting any attempt to murder any person. 
So this would be no different, really, from a legal standpoint, at least, than a police SWAT sniper taking out the hostage taker at that same moment. The key here, though, is that the suspect is making an attempt to murder this person, according to the law on the books here in California that I just read. So what this really would look like is clear and convincing evidence that a murder is about to take place, like the holding a gun to the hostage's head, posturing for the media, or whatever else could be a factor for your good Samaritan to believe that the victim's life was in immediate peril and that killing the suspect was, in fact, thwarting a murder attempt. So the legal consequences would be very similar to what a police officer goes through during an officer-involved shooting investigation. So the good Samaritan, in your scenario, Ken is the father of the victim, um, the father would then be taken in for an interview. He'd be photographed, probably have his clothing taken as evidence, and all the other investigative steps we would expect as part of this. But then he'd very likely be allowed to go home afterward. The detectives would put their investigation together and send it to the prosecutor's office. So where I am in California, that would be the district attorney's office. Um, And eventually the DA would decide on whether the facts of the homicide should be ruled as justified or not. And if the answer is not justified, then the DA would file criminal charges of manslaughter or murder. But if the ruling is that the homicide was a justifiable homicide, then all of the legal stuff is over, at least on the criminal side of things. That's about it for me this week, but I want to know how you're doing. How are you coping with staying at home? Today was my one day off this week, and I will be back to work by the time you are probably listening to this. So let me know how you're doing. Find me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. On most of those things, I'm some version of at Writer's Detective. Um, Or just say hi by going to writersdetective.com forward slash podcast and let me know what your favorite thing has been about being safer at home. I know there are a ton of things that aren't so great, but pick one favorite thing and let me know. I'd love to see or hear your favorites and hear how you're doing. And by all means, give yourself a break. If it were me not having to go to work, I'd eat that donut. I'd sleep in. I wouldn't force myself to be productive when I wasn't feeling it. He says, putting the finishing touches on this week's podcast at 11... 51 p.m. (laughs) But don't forget to leave me a review on Podchaser to help raise money for Meals on Wheels. Just go to writersdetectivebureau.com forward slash review. So stay healthy, stay home, go easy on yourself, and I will talk to you next week.